In this episode, we look at the costumes of Marjorie Terrell from the HBO series Game of Thrones coming up. Welcome back to another episode of Costume Co. I do almost weekly videos examining and analyzing costumes from some of your favorite shows and movies. If this is something that interests you, then consider subscribing. So full disclosure, I already have a Marjorie Terrell video that I made over a year ago, but I was never really happy with the quality. And since some new information has come to me, thanks to one of my viewers named M, I thought I'd do an update. So warning, there are major spoilers for the entire series of Game of Thrones. So please don't watch this unless you have seen all seven seasons. And without further ado, let's get right to the costumes. We first meet Marjorie at King Renly's camp in the Stormlands during the third episode of Season 2. Because this is the first look we get of Marjorie, it's hard to know what style originates from Highgarden and what she's incorporated from the Baratheons into her queenly attire. We know from seeing Elena and Marjorie's handmaidens in later episodes that the symmetrical blue-gray turquoise and gold brocade vest or jacket and the silky flowing skirts are a staple for the Tyrell women. Marjorie wears a flowing gray cape with an unusual hanging gold bead fastener and has added an emerald green neck scarf to this gown, a color that originates from her family crest and then is adopted in a lesser vibrant fashion into King Renly's sigil and banners. In the season two episode, The Ghost of Harrenhal, Marjorie wears a funnel dress that makes her kind of look like a human burrito with Chesterfield upholstery. So in my opinion, this is a bit of a miss for designer Michelle Clapton. Although she does argue it is intentional saying, from the very beginning, Marjorie is brave and experimental in her look, which I wanted. She was a young girl who wanted to be the queen. The funnel neck dress was ridiculous. She's a teenager trying things out. Clapton says that Marjorie's funnel dress was obviously an homage to the wonderful Alexander McQueen's costume for Bjork. It just felt right that this young ambitious girl would be experimenting with shapes, honing her style skills, which we now see her employing to great effect. It was a risk and divided the audience. For the season two finale, Valor Margulis, Marjorie's final look encompasses elements from her other two costumes. So we see a symmetrical brocade vest with a deeply plunging neckline, with a neck scarf tucked deeply into the vest front, and a flowing skirt from her first costume, and then a long off the shoulder, and what I speculate are detachable sleeves from her funnel dress. Again, the costume is in gray blue tones, and she wears a dangling rose bauble to accentuate her cleavage. By season two, Marjorie has adapted a distinctive style and signature color. According to Clapton, color plays a pivotal role in foreshadowing characters' futures. Clapton said, we do all these sort of secret symbols, color hints about the ways the court is being influenced. They are just little things that people may not notice unless they really look. Viewer Anne pointed out to me that this necklace is made with repurposed vintage Portuguese brooches by Tapazio. So I'll leave a link to a very similar Portuguese style brooch in the description below. In the season three debut, Valor de Har, Marjorie stops to visit with small folk and hand out food in Flea Bottom. While it's difficult to tell, this is actually the same costume from the season two finale. What's different here is that she no longer is wearing the sleeves or the brown silk scarf and actually has replaced it with a matching blue neck scarf. Michelle Clapton explains it like this. Marjorie Terrell sweeps into King's Landing and takes it by storm. As such, her wardrobe is very unique and very much at odds with everything else. It's a very structured look, the new style coming in after the war. For the first time in a long time, Cersei won't be the trendsetter in the capital. It's a fun way to reflect the future rivalry. 
If you saw my Cersei video, you might remember that she embellished her beautiful gowns with bits of armor, and the more paranoid she became, the more elaborate the armor became. According to Clapton, it's just the opposite for Marjorie, her saying, Cersei is forced to wear even more elaborately embroidered armored dresses in an attempt to show her strength and her rightful place, where Marjorie merely has to reveal her youthful flesh in a series of not-so-accidentally revealing dresses. Natalie Dormer explains that her wig is the beginning of how she gets into character. The key is the wig, she says. The hair department on Game of Thrones is incredible. I go from my long blonde hair to this brunette color. I look in the mirror in the hair chair and that's when I see Marjorie. Hair designer Kevin Alexander explains the transition of her hair from season two to three. We pulled so much hair away, so it makes her more distinctive and different from everyone else. With Marjorie, I wanted a lot more to be showing. I wanted a lot more flesh on her. In Episode 7, The Bear and the Maiden Fair, Marjorie dons this two-section gown with optimal skin exposure. In stark contrast to Sansa's gown, and you know I threw that pun in there for intentional reasons, the top portion features a seafoam blue and gold brocade bodice with a plunging center front and short cap sleeves. The full paper silk circle skirt and bodice are trimmed with silk velvet ribbon, and the sections are joined at the center front with a bronze metal rose and metal rose vines. You can't see it in these pictures, but the skirt overlaps in the front and at times reveals a crinoline of sorts. In this close-up shot of the detachable rose and vine embellishment, you can see that there are white thorns on the vine and that it is attached with blue ribbons. The back of the gown, meanwhile, looks in the style of Princess Jasmine's costume from Aladdin, with the silk velvet cross pieces and pointed waistband. Here's a close-up detail of Marjorie's rose picture on the bottom. The piece was commissioned by Steenson's Jewelers in Ireland. During a dinner party in which Marjorie wears her cutout dress, she admires Cersei's armor, while Cersei jabs at Marjorie about her lack of coverage. Michelle Clapton explains, Marjorie's in great competition with Cersei, which plays out in season three. It's almost like a fashion fight between them, which is quite funny. Cersei's armor corset is to show power, but then Marjorie undermines her with this girlish, revealing simplicity of her new dresses. It's a dangerous game. In episode two, Marjorie meets with Sansa and her grandmother to get the truth about Joffrey. Marjorie wears a similar gown to her other looks. This slightly asymmetrical halter bodice is constructed in blue and gold silk brocade with blue-gray velvet cap sleeves not fully attached at the front. Again, the silk skirt is an overlapping full circle that is seamed into the bodice. And then she wears the same rose and vine belt detail also attached with fine ribbons. The bodice is created by this gorgeous pale blue and gold Rubelli Venencia jacquard fabric in the color Cielo. The gown is mostly backless with cap sleeves, a yoke at the nape of the neck, and the bodice scoops deeply and ends just above her natural waistline. I thought Marjorie wore the same dress for Sansa's wedding in Episode 8, The Bear and the Maiden Fair, and that the lighting made it look more Wedgwood blue, but that's not the case, so for some reason Clapton created an almost replica of the paler blue dress. I've noticed that Clapton tends to do this. Once she finds a silhouette that she likes, she'll recreate it over and over, as we've seen with Danny, Sansa, and Cersei. Now, in this case, I'd like to say that it wasn't really worth it since, with the exception of the bodice fabric looking a little more ornate, you can't really see much difference. Here's a close-up of the silk of the skirt on the right. It appears to be hand-dyed. And here's a good close-up of the bodice. I couldn't find this same fabric. It's possible that it's a gold overlay on top of velvet like we see in her cap sleeves. In the season four opener, we see another look for Marjorie in keeping with all of her other blue-hued gowns. This one consists of a haltered bodice and slightly asymmetrical overlapping front closure with a very deep V neckline. Her arms and shoulders are bare except for the floating cap sleeves. The full-length flowy skirt is constructed from a very lightweight silk and finished off with a silk velvet belt that wraps around and crosses her back. 
Marjorie wore this gown previously in episode four of season three when Joffrey gives her a tour of the great Sept of Baylor. The fabric of the bodice is a pattern motif in shades of blues and bronzes. This polyester jacquard is also from the Rebelli Venezio collection. I'll leave a link to this fabric and all of the other Rebelli fabrics in the description below. Here's a close-up look at the bias cut belt with a bronze metal closure and then on the right floating shoulder cuffs in bias gray cut velvet and bronze twill that swing tacked and attached at the halter top. In the season four episode, The Lion and the Rose, Marjorie marries Joffrey in this unique silk and linen royal wedding dress covered with creeping briar roses, thorns and all. Clapton explains her concept for the gown saying, I wanted it to be sort of quite traditional dress in a funny way, but then again, roses can be so pretty and I didn't want her to be pretty. I wanted her to be slightly dangerous, hence the metal rose vines running along her dress, which subtly are spiked with metal thorns if you look closely, showing her danger underneath. Embroidery artist Michelle Carriger elaborates on the design, saying, Marjorie's wedding dress has a simple seductive shape, but the tangled thorny stems are there as a web-like trap to capture and snare their prey, and the roses cascade and spill down covering the ground, slowly spreading their influence in their wake. Of the final outcome, Clapton says, I'm pretty pleased with Marjorie's dress. It took weeks months even, with all the roses and embroidery, and the bias cut was hard to achieve with the cutaway elements that are essential for her style. I wanted it to be pretty, but on closer inspection, strong, and to tell the story of her ambition. The crowns particularly tell this. On the construction of the gown, Clapton says, the fittings went really well. It was a complicated construction, bias cut and then stretched onto a structure base to give support and to control the fall of the cloth around the waist. The rose covered train was heavy and we boned the hem so that it wouldn't collapse on itself. I don't think it was uncomfortable, but maybe a little heavy to walk in. We only had one of them, so we were always worried about food or coffee falling on it, but Natalie Dormer is brilliant and very careful. Marjorie's wedding gown is made from this beautiful voile by manufacturer Sacco in the color Pearl. Amazingly, this fabric is still available for purchase, so I'll leave that link below in the description. The gown took approximately six weeks to cut and construct while each fabric rose was hand rolled and stitched. Michelle Carriger says, the roses were made from the same fabric as the dress. Strips of fabric were cut on the bias and folded, then rolled into shape and each given a stem of silver mesh wire. Carriger's part took about six weeks of solid work. She explains that the stems were mainly made with silver plated cord mixed with some gimp covered with mesh wire for thicker stems and the thorns were a mix of Czech glass spikes and silver painted leather cut and molded into shape. The leaves were also cut from fine leather, painted silver in various sizes and then stitched onto the stems of the dress with additional velvet embroidered sprigs and wired leaves. Carriger says, on the front bodice, I used a few small silver metal roses from her brother's armor, further embellished with painted fish scale sequins and Swarovski crystal centers. The briars, thorny stems, grow up the bodice, but also trail down, joining at the front like a belt, with a central flower that has a pearl and labradorite center, with petals made of velvet and crystal organza. The briars flow from the front bodice around the waist and flow down the center back into a cascade of roses spilling onto the train of the dress. Hair designer Kevin Alexander was inspired by a waterfall for Marjorie's wedding hairstyle. It took seven days to film her scenes in this outfit and Natalie Dormer had to go through a two hour process each day to assemble this hairstyle. With the heat we were in, it was a lot for the actors to go through, he said. We used lots and lots of setting lotion. Meanwhile, costume designer Clapton says, with the crowns, Marjorie is all creeping roses, so it was the idea that slowly Marjorie is beginning to wrap around Joffrey and control him. According to Steenson's jewelry, the roses were created using a copper clay, hand rolling and pressing each petal into shape and slowly building up the petal layers to form the rose. 
Clapton decided the tiara needed a thin silver plate to soften the colors and tie it into the color of Marjorie's wedding dress. Clapton says of both Sansa and Marjorie's purple wedding necklaces that necklaces can look too ornate, too heavy or too modern. So I looked at Art Deco and Art Nouveau ones because I wanted to use color in it and I wanted it to be quite fine. Marjorie's bridal necklace was inspired by the same period as well. There is a link between the two, Marjorie and Sansa. Also, handcrafted by Steenson's Jewelers, the necklace was created using CAD software, cast in sterling silver and rose gold plated. It is handset with oval and round moonstones, blue topaz, and three cubic zirconia. As you can see here, Marjorie's wedding necklace is almost a direct copy of this Merle Bennett & Co. Art Nouveau necklace seen on the left, as well as a close likeness to these gold earrings with moonstones, sapphires, and diamonds, both from about 1900. British wholesale jeweler manufacturers Merle Bennett & Co. created variations of this style, and items like these come up for sale on auction sites. So I'm not sure why Clapton recreated this piece rather than using an original, although it's possible that there was a cost issue, but also more likely, as Clapton has pointed out, production required multiple necklaces. After Joffrey's death at the wedding, Marjorie switches to dark morning clothes for the rest of season four. Overall, she wears heavier, less revealing clothing in season five. The black and gold bodice is made from a gorgeous rose pattern silk brocade. According to Clapton, Marjorie wore revealing outfits to impress those around her when she was trying to become queen, but now that she is the queen, she feels she has earned her position and doesn't need to play the act anymore. Marjorie's bodice is made from this Rebelli brocade, which is unfortunately no longer available. Olenna Tyrell wears a jacket made from the same fabric but in a different color. Marjorie wears it during Tyrion's trial in Season 4, the episode The Laws of Gods and Men, or for Tywin's Wake in the Season 5 opener The Wars to Come while standing on the stairs of the Great Septa Baylor with her handmaidens. Marjorie wears a variation of this bodice during Tommen's coronation in the Season 4 episode First of His Name. And again, she wears it here in Tommen's bedchamber. The bodice is made of this Rebelli Venencia collection brocade called Madama Butterfly, although on the reverse side. And according to Rebelli, the inspiration for this silk lampus comes from an original brocade from the second half of the 18th century kept in the Rebelli archive. In the season five episode, High Sparrow, Marjorie marries Tommen in this gold brocade sleeveless gown. Of the gown, Michelle Clapton says, there is gravitas to this costume. Marjorie is queen. In this wedding, Marjorie assumes a more regal role. She doesn't want to scare Tommen who is gentle or appear too eager so soon after Joffrey's death. Being too sexy would open her up to criticism. Everything Marjorie wears is considered. Her game here is different than with her wedding to Joffrey, which was a much more aggressive, kind of triumphant dress, says Clapton. It was full of messages trying to irk Cersei. I wanted this dress to have real weight. It's establishing that Marjorie has arrived. I chose this fabric but wanted to enhance it further, so I asked the armor department to create a form of metal armor to sit over it and echo the pattern. And of Marjorie's gold crown, Clapton has this to say, this is actually the same crown that Marjorie wore at Joffrey's wedding. It seemed fitting that it should be the same. In season five, Marjorie's color palette changes to King Tom and Baratheon's family colors. In episode 3, the day after her wedding to Tommen, Marjorie greets Cersei in what looks like a bronze silk jacquard, kimono-style dressing gown. Marjorie has to have her slant on it, of course, so the gown is much tighter and the neckline is far deeper than any of Cersei's gowns. In fact, it appears that the neckline plunged deeper but was tacked into place just enough to be respectable. And while Marjorie foregoes wearing a fichu, all these handmaidens dressed in what look like an ill-fitting set of bridesmaid dresses all have neck scarves tucked into their bodices. A new thing for Marjorie is this gown that features a bronze scrollwork overlay set on top of what looks like Venetian point lace with yellow gold silk lining. 
Of this change for season five, Clapton says, It's funny, I wanted her to be a bit more like Cersei with the metal armor look. Marjorie doesn't need to play the, Oh, I've hardly got anything on and I'm so young game. She can actually say, I'm queen now. In the season 5 episode Unbowed and Bent Unbroken, Marjorie's gown is a simple gold brocade shift. The construction is a much looser fitting drape with a softly flared skirt. She has accessorized the gown with a mauve shot silk shawl. Viewer M pointed out to me that Marjorie often wears this inexpensive rose wrap ring, including with this outfit. So I'll leave a link below if you want to check it out. In the scene in which Cersei has orchestrated Marjorie's arrest by the Faith Militant, we get a better look at the fabric of her gown and bamboo leaf pattern motif. Upon her imprisonment, the Faith have stripped Marjorie of her royal attire and outfitted her in a simple linen shift. The shift has been distressed to look worn and dirty, and her wig is a natty mess meant to look as though Marjorie has been housed for days in the cell. But then they clean her up for her visit with Tommen. Her shift looks the same, except that it's cleaned and pressed, and her hair has been washed and set in a very simple style. So from this point forward until her death, Marjorie will never really return to her softly tendrilled hairdos and brocaded finery. In one of Marjorie's final looks before the end of season six, in the episode Broken Man, Marjorie meets with Elena to convince her to return to Highgarden in fear for her safety. So I'll admit this is my least favorite for look for Marjorie, but I think I do understand interim designer April Fairy's motivation behind the costume. So Marjorie is pretending to be converted to the faith, and what better way than to wear something simple and shapeless? In a return to Terrell colors, the dusty blue Madalas safe fabric trimmed in antique gold embroidery is really beautiful, but I loathe that boat neck collar with that weird center front seam. For even as pious a costume, it seems ridiculous for a queen, especially since Marjorie is wearing her crown. And finally, we have this look designed for the season finale, The Winds of Winter. I cannot confirm or deny if Michelle Clapton designed this dress or not, but I do know from Michelle Clapton's interviews that she did return for the final two shows of season six to design both Cersei and Danny's finale costumes. And from the construction and the fabric, which look typically Clapton-esque, I believe that she had some say in it. In a battle of wits where only one of them will get out alive, both Marjorie and Cersei's gowns have similar structures. Stand-up mandarin collars, seamed fitted bodices, long tapered sleeves, and long A-line skirts. Perhaps with a touch of irony, the dresses are not unlike the cut as Septon and Ella's habit. The gowns are both embossed, Cersei's hers is in leather, and Marjorie's in a brocade of sorts. And while Cersei's gown is hardened by the silver livery and epaulettes, Marjorie's is softened by her silk silvery drape fastened at the shoulders. The final thing to note is that the silvery gray fabric of the gown is embossed in what looks like the sigil rose of the house Tyrell, and like the drawing of the rose that she gives to her grandmother Olena, it shows that her loyalties still lie with her family. Sadly, Cersei outmaneuvers Marjorie before the end of season six, and realizing too late, Marjorie and her family pay with their lives. That completes this episode of The Costumes of Marjorie Terrell. If you have something to say, feel free to leave a comment below. I read all your comments and I really appreciate your thoughts. I'll have many more Game of Thrones videos coming to you before we get to the series finale in 2019. So make sure that you're subscribed so that you don't miss a thing. And thanks again to M for helping make this video possible. And as always, thank you so much for watching.